Texas Crossroads of North America, Chapter 6, Revolution 1835-1836. By September 1835, San Sequin had become convinced that the time for revolution was close at hand. The 28-year-old political chief of San Antonio had been baptized as an infant in the community as had his father, Erasmo, and his grandfather, Santiago. The Sequins had successfully navigated a number of Spanish and Mexican political shifts that affected their community. Juan had his father's example of befriending and patterning, partnering with the new Anglo immigrants to Texas. The Sequins had even taken Stephen F. Austin's younger brother, James, and introduced him to the Spanish language and Mexican culture. Now the younger Sequin wanted to take a stand against Santa Ana. In the spring, his militia had been the only one from Texas to respond to the Cohia, Texas, Governor Augustine Viesca's call for resistance for Santa Ana's imposition of centralist control in Mexico. When that attempt failed in Moncalvo, I'm sorry, Mon Monclavo Sequin and his company returned in June, as he wrote in his memoir, pledging to all our influence to rouse Texas against the tyrannical government of Santa Ana. Yet both within his own native community and among the settlements made up primarily of U.S. immigrants, people either tried to avoid actions that would affect their private fortunes and daily lives, or they remained confused and divided on what actions to take in response to the centralist control and the looming the threat from Mexican troops. On September 27th, Sequin traveled to his friend Salvador Flores's ranch to convince the Mexican ranch owners along the San Antonio rivers that they should arm themselves against the current Mexican government. He was to play an active role in the um, upcoming struggle the participation of Sequin and other Mexican residents with deep Texas roots reminds us that the revolution was not a simple battle between Anglo colonists and Mexican troops. It was a comple complex redefining of Texas carried out, often with much tension and confusion by people with different experiences of and expectations for the region. Here's the timeline. As Stephen F. Austin approached the mouth of the Brazos River on board the schooner of San Felipe on September 1st, 1835, he saw an armed Mexican naval schooner, Correro de Mexico, under attack by an American merchant brig, assisted by a small Texian steamboat, the Laura. The Correo had been patrolling the Texas coast, seizing ships suspected of avoiding customs duties. The class showed Austin how close Texas was to rebellion. I fully hoped to have found Texas at peace and tranquility. Austin told a large crowd that gathered at Rosario a week later to welcome him home, but regret to find it in commotion. All disorganized, all in anarchy, and threatened with immediate hostilities, he pleaded for peace and local government, but concluded that it was impossible to remain indifferent. When our rights are all appear to be in jeopardy, he called for a consultation of the people to decide whether to yield to the centralism of, of the Mexican government or to demand their rights under the Constitution of 1824. Austin was a changed man as he addressed his fellow citizens in the Brasilio at that evening, sick and weak from imp his imprisonment, but angry. The following week, as, as the San Felipe Committee of Correspondence and Vigilance began coordinating plans for the upcoming consultation, Austin learned that General Martin... Perfecto de Cos was en route to Texas to destroy and break up the foreign settlements in Texas. He now concluded that war is our only resource. Texas was about to embark on a course that, in retrospect, retrospect appears foreordained, foreordained, but in fact was anything but assured. As you read this, this chapter, 
At consider the following questions. Could Mexico have done anything to keep Texas from rebelling? Why did so many Texan Texans not support the rebellion? What was the what is the significance of the Battle of the Alamo in the Texas Revolution in Texas history? The rebellion early months September to December. As San Juan rode to the Mexican ranches to encourage revolt, and Austin labored with the commu committees of correspondence to organize the consultation. Others left San Antonio on a different mission. Domingo de Ugartiquea, military commander of Texas, had sent a company of a hundred dragoons under Francesco de Castaneda to retrieve a cannon provided to the citizens of Gonzales in 1831 for Indians' defense. Given the charged political climate, Ugartiquia felt it was dangerous for the colonists to possess the cannon. The first shots. The town of Gonzales, the center of Green DeWitt's colony on the Guadalupe River, had been vulnerable to raids by, by bands of Indians, and its citizens had gratefully accepted the gift of a six-pounder cannon from the Mexican government. Unlike other American colonists, they had not succumbed to the revolutionary fervor circulating through the colonies since 1832. Yet a Mexican soldier had attacked a colonist in September, and there was a concern that the government might be as harsh, as uncompromising, as some in the so-called War Party were claiming were claiming. This was the situation Ugartikea sought to address by sending the dragoons with orders to retrieve the cannon peace, peaceably, reaching the outskirts of Gonzales. Some are, however, the soldiers found that they could not cross the rain-swollen Guadalupe because the colonists had removed the ferry. On the other side of the river st stood 18 colonists led by Albert Martin, a local storekeeper. The settlers buried the cannon tube in a peach orchard, and it soon became a symbol of resistance to the Mexican government rather than the Indians. A Mexican courier swam, swam across the river, but Martin informed him that the dragoons must remain on the other side of the river until the local al alcalde, Andrew Pontoon, Ponton returned to Gonzales. Ponton, meanwhile, was directing the Gonzales Committee to, of safely as they sent letters requesting assistance to neighboring settlements. Camped on a high mound across the river, Castaneda vainly repeated the, to the colonists that he had not come to fight and was eager to talk with their representatives. But volunteer forces from Fayette and Columbus had arrived and applauded rhetoric that likened their resistance to that of the patriots of the American Revolution. They unearthed the cannon and unloaded it with, a, with metal scraps as cannonballs were not available. To Texans now 180 strong across the river during the evening of October 1st and approached the Mexican camp in the early hours of October 2nd, they were soon discovered, and following a short burst of gunfire, both sides scrambled to defensive positions as daylight arrived. The two sides skirmished again, the settlers falling back from a 40-man Mexican cavalry charge, Castaneda and John Henry Moore of the Fayette contingent then parlayed with Castaneda, protesting that... <clears throat> He, too, was a supporter of the Constitution of 1824 and that he had no order and no desire to force the cannon issue. With a makeshift flag made from Naomi DeWitt's wedding dress, white with an image of the disputed cannon and the legend, come and take it, the Texans began firing the cannon and their Kentucky rifles as well. Castaneda withdrew rather than compromise the honor of Mexican arms, for his carbons were no match for the Texans' rifles. The Mexicans had suffered only one or two casualties, the Texians none. Thus ended their fir the first battle of the revolution, significant not for its scope, but its effect.
Texians were now in open defiance and had shown they would fight an army and government form. Meanwhile, the rumor military force sent to enforce Texas allegiance to the Mexican central government had arrived on Texas soil. On September 20th, General Coast had sailed onto, into Com Campano Bay with 500 soldiers and every intention of imposing military control over Texas. His goal was to disarm colonists and arrest the leaders of the recent attack at the Anahuk and land speculators who had attempted to obtain choice land for themselves themselves at the spring legislative session in Monclova to help him in his in this endeavor he had a well-trained cavalry and 20 cannons he scoffed at the insurgents motives writing it is quite useless and vain to cover them with a hypocritical adherence to the federal constitution Cost quickly moved his troops to the Presidio of La Bahia at Goliad a volunteer Texan force made up primarily of Anglo men, men uh, from Matagorda, but including Mexican vaqueros, cowboys, and African-American freedmen. Samuel McCullough hurriedly gathered to storm La Bahia, but Cos had moved on to San Antonio, leaving only a small guard at the Presidio. Just eight days after the confrontation at Gonzales, these Texans, took the inadequately defended Presidio and Goliad with the support of some of the area's Mexican population. Volunteer forces began to gather in Gonzales, an army bent on driving Cos and the Mexican army out of, the San, of San Antonio de Bexar and Texas. But this was no well-defined disciplined fighting force. It was a volunteer enterprise with no commander-in-chief. Companies voted on their commanders and changed their minds as new combinations of militias formed. Enlisting, enlistment periods were unclear or unforeseeable, and troops came and went as they pleased. In many cases, the volunteers, especially young single men with little to lose, were just looking for a good fight. And almost all militiamen remained fiercely independent and individualistic. They distrusted the military profession, placing their faith instead in the natural abilities of the common man, unquote. Several of the volunteers realized that they needed someone who could unite them and implored Austin earnestly to come on immediately bringing all the aid you possibly can, unquote. Others realized that Texas also needed a trained, regular, uniformed, and disciplined army to defeat the Mexicans. Among them, Austin's friend, Lorenzo de Zavala, the Mexican impresario and liberal politician who cast his lot with the revolutionaries in Texas. The experienced Mexican revolutionary warned Austin that although there was individual patriotism, unquote, a uniformed patriotism did not exist. They will defend their private rights until death, but th still they do not realize the necess necessity for cooperation. Austin was convinced and advised the consultation of the absolute necessity of organizing a regular army and inviting a military man of known and tried talent to command it. Nonetheless, he accepted the role of commander-in-chief when those present in the Gonzales River volunteer camp, elected him on October 11th. He was not a military man and not in good health, but he was the one person on the on whom the volunteers could agree. Noah Smithwick, a 27-year-old a blacksmith who had joined the army to repair guns, vividly remembered the march to Beher. Buckskin breeches were the nearest approach to uniform he recalled in his later years. And there was a wide diversity even there. Some wore military caps, while others beaver hats, still others a Mexican sombrero. There was even an occasional coonskin cap. With the tail hanging down behind, some were well mounted to others walked. Many carried a Kentucky long rifle, others shotguns, and some had no firearms at all. Along the way, the volunteers had joined 28-year-olds 
Juan Sequin, Austin's longtime friend, arrived with 37 men and joined up. Austin promptly made him a captain, along with the forces of Placido Benevado's Alcalde in Victoria, Sequin brought Tejano contingents to the insurgent army to 135 men. Other late arrivals included the hard-drinking former slave trader, James Bowie, the land speculator who made infamous the knife at that bears his name, and Erastus Deaf Smith, a 48-year-old native New Yorker who was tough, fiercely independent, and excellent scout. By October, 9th, October 19th, this ragtag force drew near to San Antonio de Bejer and camped on Sol Salado Creek. As the volunteers set up camp, other Texans struggled toward a rude governmenting system. Almost 100 delegates had been elected to the consultation that Austin had planned for October 15th, but with all the military activity and the confusion, most were slow in arriving. In the meantime, a so-called permanent council, unquote, made up of representatives of San Felipe and a few other communities met and dispatched supplies to Austin's army. They also directed that the land offices be shut down to reduce the tension and turmoil over conflicting land claims. As requested by the volunteers, who feared that land speculators would snap up all the best land and began the effort to raise funds in the United States for the revolution. The permanent council was anything but permanent, however, for on November 1st, the planned consultation took over. With only 58 of the delegates in attendance, this assembly wrestled to establish the direction they should take whether to insist on a return to the Constitution of 1824 with the Texas as a separate Mexican state or complete independence from Mexico. The majority surely favored independence, but they still hoped for support from Mexican Federalists who favored the Constitution of 1824. Thus, they concluded that while Santa Ana's actions had given them the right to revolt, they pledged to create the separate a separate state government which, that would be loyal to the Constitution of 1824. Austin was happy with the compromise, thinking that it was the best policy that at that moment. The consultation also hammered out the structure for an independent provisional government, which they called it the organic law. This law established a general council made up of, a, of representatives from each municipality and a governor. In theory, these representatives were to aid the new executive sharing his duties and even extending his powers if and when they deemed it necessary in the reality they, the plan would prove troublesome. With the council and governor disagreeing on most issues, it was complicated even more with the mistaken selection of cantankerous and uncompromising. Henry Smith of Kentucky, a member of the War Party as governor, more immediately, however, was the blunder they committed with regard to the authorization of a regular army. They appointed the popular Sam Houston commander-in-chief, but they undercut his role by refusing to give him authority over the volunteer forces already in the field. How Houston, in the other words, was a general without an army. Houston was about to become one of the major figures in Texas history, but he was already a figure of some renown in the United States, a native, Virginia, a native of Virginia. He had a colorful past, which included a three-year sojourn with a Cherokee band as a teenager and notable service in the 1814 Battle of Horseshoe Bend during the War of 1812. The latter brought him to the attention of General Andrew Jackson. As Jackson's political star rose in the 1820s, Houston became a leading Jacksonian Democrat, loyal to the frontier war hero who envisioned an egalitarian American Republic, at least for Anglos, and who seemed to represent the common man against privileged interests living in Tennessee after the war. Houston rose to become state governor in 1827 and acted as an as unofficial campaign manager in Jackson's successful bid 
for the U.S. presidency a year later. Soon thereafter, Governor Houston married 19-year-old Eliza Allen, but the marriage ended quickly, mysteriously and disastrously, ruined both so socially and politically, and personally humiliated. He resigned the governorship and left Tennessee, rejoining the Cherokees, who were now living near Fort Gibson in what is today Oklahoma, with whom he had lived as a boy. Eventually, Houston began travel, again traveled to the East Coast on a mission for the Cherokees, but became involved in another incident that hastened his departure for Texas. In Washington, D.C. in April 1832, he learned that an Ohio congressman had insulted him in speech on the floor of the House of Representatives when he encountered the congressman on the street. Houston beat him with a cane, tried to reprimand tried and reprimanded him, reprimanded by the House, Houston looked to Texas for a new start. He hoped to become an agent for Galveston Bay and Texas Land Company, but when that did not work, he determined to go anyway. Houston did, however, have a mission, one provided by his old friend, President Jackson, to parley with the Comanches and to assess the Indian situation in Texas in general. Jackson also encouraged Houston to keep him advised of the events in Texas. There is also a possibility that he hinted to Houston that should a revolution begin, the United States would assist Texas by sending troops as far as the Natchez River in East Texas. Jackson considered the area between the Sabine and Natchez River disputed territory. In Mexican Texas, Houston had set up a law practice and immediately become involved in the political unrest. He served as a delegate to both the consultation of 1833 in San Felipe and the current consultation that named him Major Gen General of a non-existent regular army. In late October, he had visited the volunteer army camp outside Bixer, finding the men divided as to when at when to attack the town. He suggested that they waited they wait until they had obtained more cannons and were more fully trained. But Austin was still the commander, and although he was sick that he was hardly able to sit on his horse, he replied that he felt that it was important that the army remain at San Antonio because the salvation of the Texas of Texas depends on the army being sustained. The siege of Bixer. And upon arrival in San Antonio, General Cross had fortified the old Alamo mission complex with more than 20 cannons and almost 650 troops. His cavalry was well trained and he expected reinforcements within a few days, but many of the other soldiers were cons conscripts and convicts who had been given the choice of going to Texas or to jail. Austin decided that a frontal assault was out of the question and opted for a siege, hoping to force Cost to surrender. About a week after the siege began, the first engagement of any note occurred. When Austin dispatched a 92-man contingent under famed frontiersman James Bowie to locate a site closer to Cost's defenses, Bowie, too, had traveled to Texas with a messy past and an eye on opportunity known as Scrapper. In his na native Kentucky, he was already renowned for his use of the Bowie knife. In a Natchez duel, he had engaged in apparently fraudulent land speculation and slave running, taking captured slaves and from the Caribbean and illegally selling them to in Louisiana. Turning to entrepreneur opportunities in Texas, he had applied for Mexican citizenship in 1830 and married Ursula de Veramendi, member of a leading San Antonio family. Veramendi and her influential father, Juan Martin de Veramendi, died in 1833 cholera epidemic, but Bowie continued to try to build his Texas holdings while advocating for war. As night approached on October 27th, Bowie's contingent dug in at a bend in the San Antonio River near the Mission Concepcion. 
This would allow the volunteers to fight in a manner more natural to them. From behind the riverbanks and the free trees rather than on an open prairie, if the Mexicans were to attack, recognizing that Bowie had only a small group, General Cost dispatched 100 infantry and 300 dragoons to drive them for the from the camp. Their camp, the Mexicans advanced with muskets and belching cannons, but they proved ineffective against the well-sheltered Texians. The fire from their long rifles accurate at a greater distance than the muskets and their snipe and hide combat. Tactics behind or tactics carried the day. Only one Texian was fatally wounded. Approximately 76 men in the Mexican force were killed or wounded and costs withdrew. Worried that his army might become separated and be defeated, piecemeal Austin had been busily moving the rest of the volunteer army forward and came upon the scene shortly after the Mexican soldier soldiers had retreated. He was not a military man, but his instinct told him that he should immediately follow up on his apparently easy victory and attack the city itself. Cooler heads prevailed, however, reminding him on this of the significant defensive fortifications into which the Mexicans had retreated. Again, the volunteer army made camp, this time at the bend in the San Antonio River. Now the opening forces sat and waited, costs and reinforcements, Austin for re reinforcements and for a siege gun or guns that would breach causes entrenched defenses. The Texian army of the Pope began to disintegrate as men, some men left, impatient with the lack of action. Others drank heavily, many fell ill without medication or treatment available. A lack of strong, decisive leadership and a shared understanding of what they were trying to accomplish contributed to the discipline problems. On November 2nd, Austin wrote Philip Demet, Commander of the Goliad Garrison, whether the army can be kept together long enough to await the arrival of reinforcements and the necessary supply of heavy battering cannon and ammunition. I'm sorry to say, is somewhat uncertain. The Texians cheered when a number of artillery pieces arrived and promptly wheeled them into action against the Mexican fortifications. Although with the little with little effect, the arrival of the Grays, a volunteer company formed in New Orleans, further lifted their spirits. They brought visible support from the United States. A development the Guild called Mexican officials and proved to them that the United States had designs on Mexican territory. Volunteer companies from Kentucky, Mississippi, Georgia, and Alabama would later join the Texian fight, as well as additional deserters. From the General Edmund P. Gaines, U.S. troops who had been stationed east of the Sabine under the ruse of preventing Indian troubles on November 22nd, hearing that the Mexican force was demoralized and suffering from desertions, Austin ordered his troops to prepare to attack, but his officers told him that the troops were disillusioned. I'm sorry disillusioned with his command and that no more than 100 men would obey his order. Some historians believe that Houston was behind some of the dissatisfaction as he had made no secret of his concerns about the wisdom of the siege. Reluctantly, Austin rescinded his order and acknowledged that he could better pay, play a diplomatic role. He decided to accept an appointment as commissioner to the United States. He assembled the troops on November 24th and told them of his decision. About 400 of his troops agreed to stay and fight and immediately elected Colonel Edward Burleson as their leader. On November 25th, Austin left the camp for San Felipe. Despite the men's votes, a vote of confidence, and recognition of the, by the provisional government on December 1st, Burleson inherited a fractured and debilitated fighting force, one ready to strain at any rumor.
That's when a scout entered camp on November 26 with a report of 100 men in a large pack train headed towards San Antonio. Word quickly spread that it was a company of dragoons return, returning with a pack of mules loaded with silver to pay the garrison Mexican soldiers. Burleson sent James Bowie with 100 mounted men to survey to pack train warning him to refrain from engagement, but on finding the train beside a creek south of the town, the pugnus Bowie immediately attacked it with a little broadshed on either side. The Mexican column, at a disadvantage with their muskets, abandoned the pack train. For the safety of the Bayer fortifications, the Texian volunteers found only grass in the packs. The train had been foraging party trying to supply the hungry horses in the garrison evidence that the Mexican garrison was indeed in difficult straits. The incident became known at, to history as the grass fight. Burleson ha had, be had been considering withdrawal, began to think, about, think seriously about ordering an attack. Divided opinion over rebellion. Further confirmation of the Mexican garrison's plight Came, to, came when Koss released two Anglos living in San Antonio, John Smith and Samuel Maverick, on the condition that they return to the United States. Instead, they made their way to the ranch of Jose Antonio Navarro, a revolution-minded Tejano they brought, encouraging reports of the garrison's vulnerability of and Burleson gave the order to attack, but his officers responded with further arguments, and Burleson like Austin before him, rescinded the order. Those who had finally been preparing to fight responded with anger. An estimated 250 to 300 men left camp, and others sank into gloom. Burleson decided that his only concur recourse was to give up the siege and retreat to Goliad to establish winter quarters. Many of the troops responded to his announcement of, the, of this decision on December 4th with palpable frustra ugh, frustration sorry, and anger. Why had they marched to the outskirts of Behar and stayed there for as long as seven weeks on short rations and rumors only now to leave? The indecision of the beleaguered insurgency leaders reflected division within Texas and the United States over the issue of whether to support the rebellion. Southern slavery advocates were too involved in their own political battles in the United States to send significant aid to Texas. And even within Texas, the rebels found significant lack of interest among many residents. Insurgent leaders despaired when Anglo settlers, including some prominent ones, remained loyal to Mexico. They did not aid the war effect effort in any way. They did not share their food with or other resources, and the men did not serve in local militias. The response was uneven from the other groups as well. Although some Tejanos would join the war effort, those in the Nagadoches and Goliad Victoria areas were already divided. In Nagadoches, Anglo immigrants were suspicious of all Mexicans and the Tejanos had reason to be wary of a rebel effort that could leave them even more at the mercy of newcomers. Local rebel leaders formed a militia with prominent area landowner Vincent Vicente Cordova as its commander, but Cordova and his fellows carefully distanced themselves from the war and focused on defending Tejano rights and participating in the local power structure. In the meantime, Irish settlers had fought alongside the Mexican military when in a side action in late October, Goliath commander Dimit had sent a small fo force to take the Mexican post of Libet Lepantitlan, I'm sorry, on the Nusus River. The Irish of San Patricia shared allegiances as well as Catholic religion as with their Mexican neighbors who had assisted them in getting settled. Carlos de la Garza, whose family had settled on a ranch near Goliad, 
offer the services of about 80 Guerreros Victoriana to serve as scouts for General Jose de Uria when he swept through that area in the spring of 1836 while his in-laws Silvestre de Leon and Placido Benevot Benevedes fought on the Texan side, as did the Irish residents of Refugio. No wonder Houston was having little luck recruiting for his regular army. Despite the work of the permanent council and the consultation efforts to resist allegiance to Santa Ana's government or to declare outright independence, remain confused, piecemeal, and diffuse. Meanwhile, the Solon Ragtag Volunteer Army camped outside San Antonio was, for better or for worse, the most united potent force the Texas insurgents had, and this army was about to move the conflict to a new level to make it indisputably a revolution. From rebellion to revolution, victory and defeat, December to March, Benjamin Rush Milan, Milan had a more checkered past in Texas than most of his follow, fellow volunteers at the Siege of Behar. A veteran of the War of 1812, by 1818 he was in Texas trading with the Comanches. In New Orleans, the following year he had joined James Long, Long's first filibustering expedition, traveling to Veracruz and Mexico City. Although he spent time in jail in the capital after the Constitution of 1824, introduced Republican government, he became a Mexican army colonel. As an unsuccessful impresario in Texas, he took his case for land titles. In Governor Viesca in Moncovla, just as Viesca declared against Santa Ana and was captured and jailed with Viesca, escaping he had made his way northward to the Goliad area. Here, a Texian Detachment sent to, to take, Goliad had found him hiding under a tree, weary and alone. Milan, who joined the volunteer army, refused to accept Burl Burleson's order to retreat, thereby providing the spark for the next series of revolutionary events. The Storming of Bixer Milan, Milan returned to camp from a scouting mission on December 4th to find his compa compatriots packing up. Malam got Burleson to agree to that if he could convince enough of the remaining men to storm the village, Burleson would stay with the others as a reserve for force to cover a possible retreat. Malam emerged from the meeting shouting the legendary question, who will follow old Ben Malam into San Antonio? Three hundred of those remaining, about six out of ten, stepped forward. Malam sent J.C. Neal, an experienced artilleryman, with a small group of men to distract Casas' troops with a feint on the Alamo, while he and Colonel Frank Johnson led two columns of rebel troops into the city. At least a few dozen Tejanos joined in the assault, while others, such as Erasmo Seguin, provided grain from his ranch. The Texans fanned out and rushed down the streets, getting within 200 yards of the central plaza before being discovered. Then the Mexicans began firing their artillery loaded with the can with canister down the narrow streets, forcing the Texans to take refuge inside nearby homes and sending men, women, and children out in the middle of the night. The easy part of the battle was over. Now it became a slow advance from house to house, and the Texians had decided had a decided advantage in that their Kentucky long rifles were much more accurate than their the muskets of that the majority of the Mexican troops had. On the second day of fighting, a Mexican sniper firing much more a much more accurate British Baker rifle killed Malam as he surveyed the defenses through a field glass. Infuriated at the loss of their leader, the Texans renewed the assault. Their slow progress forced General Cost to try to try a desperate measure. 
Thinking that the Texian camp might be poorly defended, he ordered a daring attack on their base, but J.C. Neal's artillery quickly turned them back. Koss was running out of supplies and workable defense plans when Uga Tekia finally arrived with a relief column on the afternoon of December 8th. Most of the men he brought with him were shackled convicts and reluctant participants who proved not only resistant at, to taking orders, but disruptive and violent, even attacking Koss himself. The heavy artillery fire from both sides had created a landscape scape of blackened tree stumps, bl battered walls, smoldering ash heaps over the objections of some of his men. On the morning of December 9th, Koss had a white truce flag unfurled and asked for terms of surrender. Malam was <clears throat> one of only four Texians who died in the fighting, along with an estimate, estimated 14 wounded. Mexican losses were estimated at 150 dead and wounded. Burleson and Johnson granted liberal terms to Koss, allowing him time to remove his wounded and supplying him with such provisions as can be obtained for his retreat to the Rio Grande. In turn, Koss promised not to take up arms against the rebel forces again, as he directed the removal of his troops, residents of San Antonio, who had been forced to flee the fight, returned Juan San Antonio, I'm sorry, Juan Antonio Chavez remembered, we found the house badly shattered with shot and shell. The doors were riddled with bullets and grape shot from the cannon and escapete, escapetes, muskets, and rifle balls. The men who took San Antonio felt that they felt that they had sent a decisive message in favor of a return to the Mexican Constitution of 1824, that they would serve as a rallying signal for a general Mexican revolt against Santa Ana. At the same time, many Anglos clearly favored complete independence, either long-term or as means of transferring the region to the United States. A couple of weeks after the Texians' victory at Bejar, the Goliad garrison proclaimed its independence from Mexico. A Texas official in New Orleans collecting supplies for the Texians expressed his sense that a very large majority of the people wished to come into the Union with Uncle Sam. Yet, in general, Anglo leaders remained cautious about advocating a full break from Mexico. That hesitation was apparent when the Texians planned to attack Matamoros while Austin was laying siege to San Antonio. He endorsed the idea of the Matamoros expedition, which he and others had hoped would attract support from Mexican liberals who also favored the Constitution of 1824, but the effort suffered from uncoordinated leadership and floundered when Mexican General Jose de Urea arrived to defend the city. Colonel James Fannin, who was one of the several commanders assigned to the expedition settled in Goliad, where he bolstered the defenses of La Bahia which he deemed crucial to the defense of Texas. I will go ahead and pause here and continue with chapter six, part two. Thank you.